Hello, everybody. Today, I will be starting off our presentation on Chapter 6 of the new Jim Crow labeled The Fire This Time. So to start off this chapter, Alexander talks about this um, mass protest that took place in Jenna, Louisiana in September of 2007. And the protest was as a result of um, six young African-American boys who were um, sentenced and charged uh, on uh, attempted murder charges um, based on the assault of a white boy at their public high school. Now, um, many people believe that um, this was tied to racially charged conflicts um, occurring at the school, notably being the hanging of nooses on the school tree. Um, and for those of you who don't know, nooses are um, ropes tied in the shape of um, what was called the hangman noose, which was used to lynch African Americans, but also served as a symbol of um, you know, white supremacy. Um, Alexander kind of paints the picture of this protest um, being very important for the kind of new um, conversation of, uh, of civil rights in the new era, in the modern day. And um, there were many famous people at the march and um, it kind of sparked this question of the justice system being biased against young black men, which was very important. And it did eventually pay off after the protest um, and the boys charges were um, minimized. However, this did um, start a national conversation based on the media of um, the whole system being biased. Now, uh, in order to um, understand this better, Alexander includes the quote, it was evidence of old fashioned racism that made it possible for a new generation of protesters to frame the attempted murder charges against six black teens in a manner that mainstream America would understand as racist. Uh, in addition to this, many people, um, many people began uh, labeling this protest as being the new civil rights movement, you know, sparking this kind of new intention. However, uh, Alexander clarifies that this could not be labeled as a new civil rights movement due to the fact that it's um, not challenging the prevailing system and rather challenging an older system that was put into place. Uh, and Alexander also talks about how this kind of this cultural, um, this shift has to be focused more on the now and what's happening currently in society. So the next portion of the reading talks about, uh, you know, more specifically, the um, the place of social of civil rights groups and advocates um, and the role they play um, in terms of the dismantling of the case system. Now Alexander kind of talks about the two themes being that of uh, in, in terms of the failure to recognize mass incarceration being that of denial and this kind of awkward silence that has resided um, over the past few decades. Uh, Alexander talks about how um, the, whole, um, the whole theme of civil rights groups kind of trying to dismantle this system um, are not putting in enough um, effort into directly focusing on things that are problematic, such as, you know, the disproportionate amount of black men in prison. Um, Alexander talks about how, you know, this kind of idea of looking at smaller problems that are more feasible are easier to deal with um, is not going to actually put a dent in the system. And uh, it's something that should be recognized and um, should be talked about a little bit more. So in order to clarify this more, Alexander talks a little bit about the history of the civil rights. And based on this portion of the reading, I took away the main idea of the civil rights um, to be the grassroots organizing and strategic mobilization of public opinion. So kind of coming from the perspective of the people at the community level um, and taking it to uh, another level and creating discussion and change based on that. So Alexander brings up the um, example of Brown versus Board of Education, which kind of shows a, uh, a shift in the understanding of how important, you know, the top of the pyramid is um, and what role they play. So in terms of this shift, Alexander talks about the importance of civil rights lawyers um, and at the legal level, um, how much power they attain in making change for um, the African American community. So um, in saying this, Alexander points out how this is a, an example of, you know, the disconnect between the grassroots level and the community level um, 
all the way to the, uh, the people at the top of the pyramid who have the most power. A good quote um, on page 226 kind of says that the lobby came with the lawyers and lobbyists said it was with little or no input from the people whose fate hung in the balance. And you know, this further just proves how they're losing touch with the movement itself by not um, taking the word directly from the communities who are affected by these problems. So kind of to continue from this, um, Alexander talks about how this grassroots movement has turned into a legal campaign and how lawyers have a tendency to identify and concentrate on problems that know how to, that they know how to solve and um, in addition problems that are easily solved through litigation and within all of this um, there uh, the mass incarceration of colored people was almost forgotten about and in order to further prove this, Alexander brings up this idea of how abolitionists have gone great lengths to identify Black people who defy racial stereotypes. So an example of this could be during the Rosa Parks era, um, you know, during, you know, at the height of civil rights movement, um, abolitionists, you know, at the legal level, at, at the highest level, basically wanted to um, press on white society how this, you know, this, this poster woman, um, that being Rosa Parks, you know, someone who looks good to society um, is defying these stereotypes and that's kind of the message they want to prove. However, this is not realistic, nor does it um, paint the right picture by trying to prove who is, um, you know, who is going to be this poster boy or woman for them. And um, in addition, those names that you see on this slide, Claudette Colvin and Mary Louise Smith, um, also, you know, played large roles in this movement, however, weren't publicized to the same level as Rosa Parks because, you know, they didn't fit the category or they weren't um, to the standards of the abolitionists that they wanted to, um, they wanted to pose to society. So uh, kind of to lead off this chapter, Alexander says how, um, leads with this kind of rhetorical question that of being, have we really made progress since um, 1968? You know, unemployment stats paint this picture of, you know, African Americans being near the bottom of, uh, for their men being employed. However, we can't forget that these statistics don't include African American men who are incarcerated. So the numbers are actually um, disproportionate to what the society believes. So um, kind of to leave this off, um, if we continue on this path, you know, we will make small, um, minimal change. However, we're not going to make a dent into the, the bigger system itself, that being the case system, and um, putting any effort towards that, we need to focus our agenda onto something, um, looking at a bigger picture. So the first section that I'll be going over is tinkering is for mechanics, not racial justice advocates. Uh, but before I go over what this section is about, I wanted to discuss a quote that I found at the beginning of this section. It says, if we hope to return to the rate of incarceration of the 1970s, a time when many civil rights activists believed rates of imprisonment were egregiously high, we would need to release approximately four out of five people. Now, you might be thinking, um, releasing a lot of people, especially of uh, people of color who might have not committed a crime, would be humanely beneficial. Um, but it's not that easy. Um, in fact, these prisons treat are act like uh, businesses that provide money for people who work in prisons and for the entire country. Um, to put this into perspective, in 2015, California houses about 132,992 inmates. And for every inmate, um, the prison makes about $64,642. Now, if we release that many people um, um, from the prisons to match the rates of the 1970s, we would see that a lot of prisons would lose a lot of money. And these prisons need money to provide uh, stuff like phones for inmates to talk to family weapons for prison guards, health care for the inmates, and to provide more prisons to house criminals. And here's a graph that shows the prison system growth from the 1950s to 2016. And this all started when President Nixon 
um, began the war on drug and tough on crime policies just around the 1970s. Once President Ronald Reagan took office in the 1980s, uh, the prison population was around 329,000 people. But after he left office, the prison population automatically doubled to around 627,000 people. And that's mainly because a lot of colored people were sent to jail due to uh, the war on drugs. Now, most of us would ask ourselves, is it time to end the war on drugs? Now we know that the war on drugs helped provide money uh, for prisons and the, um, the entire country. Um, but there are some good pros and cons to ending the war on drugs. Um, for the pros, um, it allows uh, people to eradicate racial profiling and help heal the urban poor. So this is saying that we would be able to help people of color um, get better treatment into um, a society, into our society. Uh, that's not filled with a lot of racism. However, um, by ending the war on drugs, People like prison guards would need to find new jobs. Um, military equipment will be shipped um, to the military. And you might as well say that drug, any type of drug can be legal, whether it's not as harmful to uh, drugs that can harm the body. And so the next um, section is that I'll be going over is let's talk about race resisting the temptation of colorblind ad advocacy. Um, because of the war on drugs policy of targeting just mainly colored people, pe um, most people are trying to find a new system to stop crime. And a quote that I found in this book that was interesting is that the current system we're using right now is better designed to create crime and a perpetual class of people labeled criminals rather than to eliminate crime or reduce the number of criminals. So this quote is basically saying that instead of reducing crime rates, um, you're basically stripping um, privileges from inmates um, to get like special needs or necessary needs for to survive. So such as uh, finding a job to make money and finding public housing. With those privileges taken away, uh, people, especially people of color, um, would just be homeless and uh, they would have a harder time to survive. And if you guys want to go over um, how mass incarceration creates crimes, um, in this video, John Green discusses um, this topic. Um, but for time purposes, I won't be playing this video. And so the solution that many people thought of how to um, fix the criminal justice system is colorblindness. Now, recall colorblind racism has to do with um, the idea that people do not see race as an issue. They believe that race does not even exist. And a quote that I found um, quoted from The Audacity of Hope by Barack Obama uh, says, white guilt has largely exhausted itself in America, even the most fair-minded of whites. Those who genuinely like to see racial inequality ended and poverty relieved tend to push back victimization or race specific claims. Now, this quote is basically saying that whites um, feel bad that um, they're targeting black people to go to jail, which led to um, negative feelings stirred up towards the black community and that led to the white community to feel guilty of how they treated these people of color. And they thought that, okay, let's just 
ignore um, the idea of racism. Let's just treat everyone the same. But there are some complications if colorblindness became um, a part of the criminal justice system when arresting a lot of um, criminals. Um, this would mean that prisons would not store as many inmates right now, um, which would lead to a loss of money. Um, but um, if crime rates among like different racial groups um, rise, so aside from the black community, it's like mainly whites or Asians, if those criminal rates um, rose more than you can deter race as a major factor of the criminal justice system. But because of how um, we see um, incarceration right now, we rely on um, racial stereotypes to maintain um, the um, economic growth in prison businesses. Against color blindness. Color blindness, as Robin D'Angelo also touched upon in White Fragility, is the idea that race doesn't matter. What matters is the actions a person does. Alexander says that color blindness is really detrimental to races, especially African Americans, because it devalues race. For Blacks, they have always been treated poorly, but saying you don't care about race implies that you don't really care that they've suffered. As stated, Saying that one does not care about race is offered as an exculpatory virtue when in fact it can be a form of cruelty. Also with color blindness, we forget to see the divisions within our current societies. All of the segregated and unequal areas become forgotten and remain unfixed. In a speech many years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. stated that the whole system of slavery was largely perpetuated through spiritually ignorant people. Similar to mass incarceration, King explains that people who have come to believe in color blindness as a good thing are the ones that kept slavery in, of black people as something unimportant, and they even dehumanized the races who suffered. Both conservatives and liberals think color blindness will solve all racism even though it really won't. Conservatives stand on the side that color blindness leads to individualism, which governs society by the person, not by the group. Liberals, on the other hand, hand see color blindness as a path of racial equality, a place where we won't think about race. But neither group really understands that our racial differences will always exist among us. As Alexander states at the end though, the most important thing is to understand that we must understand other people, race and all, because a lot of what is wrong in society is the lack of care for another's race. When looking at racial justice, affirmative action with a dictionary definition, the practice or policy of favoring individuals belonging to groups known to have been discriminated against previously seems like an amazing idea to prevent greater discrimination. But Alexander says that it is more of a racial bribe than anything else. That is not to say that affirmative, affirmative action is bad, but it is very complicated. The claims that racial justice advocates should reconsider the traditional approach to affirmative action because A, it has helped to render a new caste system largely invisible. B, it has helped to perpetuate the myth that anyone can make it if they try. C, it has encouraged the embrace of a trickle-down theory of racial injustice. D, it has greatly facilitated the divide and conquer tactics that gave rise to mass incarceration. And E, it has inspired such polarization and media attention that the general public now wrongly assumes the, that affirmative action is the main battlefront in US race relations. The problem is that we now see many successful colored people whose communities have suffered and that, that we've come a long way and everything is the way it should be. In reality, those races still suffer, but we still are in our colorblind mindsets. The black community is still doing as poorly 
and even worse in child poverty than Martin Luther King Jr.'s time. Another part of affirmative action that is hurting racial progress is the fact that it keeps the idea of colorblindness in people's subconscious. Affirmative action allows the reason that many black people are felons, not because they are born into the life of crime, but they choose the life of crime. And it is also, and it just so happens that a huge number of black people have chosen that lifestyle. Affirmative action helps make the emergence of a new racial caste system seem implausible. Then Alexander brings up black exemptionalism, where several black people are given as examples that anyone, no matter their race or social standing, can make it to the top, even though it is really just colorblindness again. Finally, Alexander gives an example of affirmative action being counterproductive. Martin Luther King Jr. even warned about what it takes to change a racial unjust, racially unjust society. Since affirmative action only focuses on the individual, industries just try to change their racial makeup thinking it will improve the racial outlook. For example, the police department might hire black chiefs or officers and change who makes up the police. police but the role of the police in our society has not changed. Okay, the second to last section is titled Obama, the Promise and the Peril. This section answers the question, what were the effects on the war on drugs by the Obama administration? So Obama campaigned on criminal justice reform and even exposed that he used drugs growing up as well. It would make sense that he would fight against drug criminality that could have tagged him as a felon and ended all his chances at reaching his aspirations. However, Obama filled his cabinet with people who were historically hard on drugs, such as Joe Biden. He wanted to please the portion of the population who supported tough on crime policies while disregarding his community. In his actions, he funded Clinton's COPS program and the, and the Byron Grant program that funded an increased community law enforcement. And as Alexander states, these programs, despite their benign names, are responsible for the militarization of policing, SWAT teams, pipeline drug task force, and the laundry list of drug war horrors described in chapter two. He also states that Obama's budget for law enforcement is actually worse than the Bush administration in terms of ratio of dollars devoted to prevention and drug treatment as opposed to law enforcement. Alexander also explains that his actions debatably did not change the violent crime rate at all. However, Obama was not heavily criticized by the black community and activist groups during his presidency. Alexander asks, could it be that many African Americans would actually prefer to ignore racial issues during Obama's presidency to help ensure his smooth sailing and a triumphant presidency, no matter how bad things are for African Americans in the meantime? A question that came to my mind was, did Obama's perpetuation of the war on drugs justify in the mind of the black community the box of which they had been put in through criminality? The final section is titled, All of Us or None. In this section, Alexander reflects on the racial class structure of this country and attempts to pave the, the way for new solutions. She, she believes the answer is in an all of us ground up restructured class. Alexander feels affirmative action only helps a few and makes it seem as if the black community is doing better when it is truly not. In the end, the same racial class structure still exists. She writes, diversity driven affirmative action as described and implemented today sends a different message. The message is that some of us will gain inclusion. She also does not believe the white man is the enemy. While they generally have privilege, they still struggle greatly in regions like the South where they receive poorer education than black communities and cities. She believes this struggle contributes to the adoption of using racial status to make up for poor work and life conditions. Alexander explains time and time again, poor and working class whites were persuaded to choose their racial status interests over their common economic interests with blacks, resulting in the emergence of a new caste systems that only marginally benefited whites, but was devastating for African Americans. Affirmative action only angered these struggling whites and created what seemed like racial backlash. Alexander believes there must be a movement for all who are struggling to come together as one. 
This will require everyone to give up their privileges. She calls for a movement much greater than just solving mass incarceration. It is a coalition of people that care for and advocate for the struggles of all people in the country. She writes, but if the movement that emerges to end mass incarceration does not meaningfully address the racial divisions and resentments that give rise to mass incarceration, and if it fails to cultivate an ethic, genuine care, compassion, and concern for every human being of every class, race, and nationality within our nation's borders, including poor whites who are often pitted against poor people of color, the collapse of mass incarceration will not mean the death of racial caste in America. Alexander believes we must take serious action now and solve these problems as one, just as Martin Luther King believed up to his death. And finally, our group has some discussion questions for you guys to reflect on. The first one is, due to the large cultural shift in the system for civil rights advocates, whose focus has moved from the streets to the courtroom, what kind of work do these ground level organizations need to be focusing on in order to really start making progress on the caste system? The second one is, our criminal justice system is flawed. Instead of reducing crime rates, we are increasing crime rates. In addition, black people or people of color are more likely to be incarcerated. How can we change the system to allow people with felonies, especially people of color, to have a fair chance of gaining special privileges, such as jobs and public housing? The third question is, would affirmative action still be important to include in a society that, that suffers from racial injustices, or would it just hinder the progression of our racial consciousness? Why or why not? And the last question is, did Obama's perpetuation of the war on drugs justify in the mind of the black community, the box of which they had been put in through criminality? Thank you.